A reading of the Holy Gospel according to John, the eighth chapter. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Before I launch into the Reformation sermon I've prepared, let me begin with words that we prayed together moments ago in our confession, where we said, Reform us to be a church powered by love, willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. After worship today, you'll be invited to sign two oversized cards that we have in our welcome area. One will be going to the Tree of Life congregation and the other to the first responders of the Squirrel Hill community in light of yesterday's events. We will be expressing our love and solidarity in their time of loss. And as one of the co-conveners of the Religious and Spiritual Council of Westchester, we've already formulated a response affirming the dignity of peoples of all religions. So you'll be invited to share in that support following worship. In 1888, a Norwegian businessman opened the newspaper and was surprised to see in the paper that day his own obituary, although he was alive and well. It was a mistake, of course. The businessman's brother had passed away, and a careless reporter had gotten the wrong name and wrote the obituary for the wrong person. The businessman did not like what he read. The obituary did not include anything about his ideals, his principles, his values, the things that were most important to him. Instead, it just listed things like accomplishments of his factories and his patents and his great wealth. The businessman who saw his own obituary that day was Alfred Nobel. And decades before, he had invented an explosive material that came to be known as dynamite, which made him incredibly wealthy and famous. He decided on the day he read his obituary to begin a new life, to seek not to be known for an invention that brought destruction and violence, but rather to commit to peace. And so in earnest, he began donating his money, speaking out for peace, and he made provisions in his will for a foundation, a foundation which to this day continues to support the Nobel Prizes. They reward the greatest contributions each year in humanity and in peace. Instead of being known only by his inventions, today he is probably best known as a philanthropist who provided for the Nobel Peace Prize. For Alfred Nobel, the realization of the brevity of life was a catalyst for change. A catalyst for change, realizing that life can be great, but death is real. And one thing I appreciate about the congregational life of the church is that we don't shy away from that reality. We don't try and evade it or deny it, much like the culture around us tempts us to do. 
We are honest about it and we meet it head on because we believe we have a good shepherd who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. So we acknowledge the brevity of this earthly life and recognize, therefore, the precious gift that is before us and therefore hope to live lives of meaning and purpose full of compassion and generosity and ample portions of forgiveness and dedication to what is right. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Not only is that a lyric from a pop tune in the 90s, but it could be a great summary of what Reformation Sunday is all about. We are here to celebrate the transformative power of the gospel. If the Son makes you free, Jesus said, you will be free indeed. God sent Jesus to bring about change for the positive, to make God's power available in a new way, to break bonds of sin and injustice, to build bridges to reach out to the outcast, to set those free who are captive in sin, to announce the year of the Lord's favor, to usher in the kingdom of God. And scripture has many examples of those who were transformed by their encounter with Jesus. Think about earlier this year, the children of this congregation filled this space with a musical presentation of Zacchaeus, the one who was transformed from selfish cheater to benevolent philanthropist. Or think of Simon, the backwater fisherman who stumbles and bumbles his way three years along Jesus' side, never quite getting it right, but he becomes Peter, transformed into the rock upon which the church is built. Or consider Saul of Tarsus, involved in acts of violence and aggression, threats and intimidations against Christians, but he experiences the resurrected Christ and it transforms his heart to change directions and to be transformed from Saul to Paul, the well-traveled evangelist and author of our reading from Romans. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the promise that God wants transformation in your life, in our homes, in our communities, in the world. It's why we need a response to our stewardship program more than ever so that the church's witness will continue with strength upon strength. Today on Reformation Sunday, we of course consider the German monk, Martin Luther, who unleashed a reformation by starting with the man in the mirror. As he sought to make peace with God, and studied scripture diligently, he discovered something that he wanted to share, and he started a movement. The catalyst for him was the promises in Holy Scripture. Promises like we heard in Romans, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or promises like we hear in Ephesians chapter two, for it is by grace through faith that we have been saved so that no one can boast, so that we can do the good works that God has prepared for us. He initiated a movement to bring about change with these words. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. One historian wrote that there is no doubt that Luther's search for peace with God changed the whole course of human history. He challenged the power of Rome over the church. He smashed the chains of superstition and tyranny and restored the Christian liberty to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
And so here we are, 501 years later, hoping to continue in the tradition of Lutheran Christians who seek to live in the spirit of Reformation, rejoicing in the transformative power of the good news of Jesus, and therefore continually asking ourselves, what, O oh God, needs to be reformed? What needs to be changed in me? in our homes, in our communities, in the world? Will we allow people bent on violence to define our age? Will we speak out and act for what is right and peace at all costs? Will we find ways to disagree without being disagreeable? Will we commit to removing the log in our own eye before we attempt to help our neighbor with the splinter that might be in theirs. Jesus came to offer a way to be transformed, to be a part of the kingdom, to be involved in good news, a final victory over sin and brokenness and evil, a power to reform hearts, minds, and lives. Jesus seeks to bring us together, to announce to us that we are a community forgiven and free and empowered to make a difference in the world, that we can maybe live out Margaret Mead's words when she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So let us keep reforming, church. For we are captive to the word of God as well. We are captive to the promises found there, including the one that St. Paul wrote when he said, At the last trumpet, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. Reform us to be a church powered by love, willing to speak for what is right, Act for what is just and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen.